Good to see you. Happy 4th of July, the greatest day of the year, in my opinion. <clears throat> I have to say, not Christmas. Oh, dear Lord, not Christmas. I have to say, the 9 a.m. got pretty wild in here, but I know you're not going to be outdone, right? Hello? That's right. <clears throat> As Jen said... We're finishing up the Greatest Story series. Thank you. You guys upset? I've got good news for you. Next week, we're kicking off a new series. And it's really kind of a spin-off of this one. Because what we're going to see is, there's actually a whole other story going on in the background. It's the story of the unseen. And so our series next week is called The Unseen, and we're going to look at what's going on in the backdrop behind the story. And so I'm kind of excited about next week. I hope you'll come back, because I'm going to teach a little bit, give you a crash course on spiritual beings in the Bible. Spiritual beings in the Bible, because, you know, most people are probably cool, I believe in God. If you're a little weirder, you might say, I believe in God and the devil, if you're way out there, you might say, I believe in God and the devil and angels and demons. But then you can actually go with what the Bible has to say about spiritual be beings. And it's going to be real crazy. So that's what we're going to do next week. Now I'm going to give you a real quick crash course overview of how the Hebrew people saw the unseen and what that means for us. Cool? <clears throat> So we're in season five, the last season of The Greatest Story. In my opinion, this is the best season solely because it's the season we live in now. We're season five people. All of the plot lines and the storylines of the Bible get brought to their fulfillment and conclusion in the life of Jesus. We see God's had this plan to fix all the issues, to bring his creation back to him. And that's all tied together in the story of Jesus. Are you with me? But now we're in season five, and there was this great promise that, hey, once this redemption plan, once God's great masterful work is completed, the Spirit's going to come. The Spirit's going to be poured out. And when that happens, this old world that you've been familiar with is going to be a different place. Once the Spirit's poured out, it's all going to be different. And the prophet Isaiah, he tells us, yeah, when that happens, creation's going to be made new. And lions are going to lay with lambs. And children are going to play with cobras. I don't really know how else to say it. It's going to be weird. But it's going to be familiar at the same time. That's what's going to happen when the Spirit comes. You know, you all know what Spirit is? <clears throat> the Hebrew word for Spirit is Ruach. Can you say that? you got to spit a little bit. Ruach. This is what Ruach is. Everybody... Put your hand in front of your mouth. Even people in the balcony. I can see you. Don't think I can't see you. Put your hand in front of your mouth and everybody say, hello. Let's try it one more time. Say, hello. Did you feel that? 
That's Ruach. We're a long way off from Casper the Ghost when we're talking about spirit. Ruach, it's breath, it's wind, it's spirit. We have three words. Hebrew, there's one. What it has to do with is the personal, life-giving, invigorating presence of God. That's spirit. And the Bible says when that comes, everything's going to be different. It's interesting, as season five people, we know how the story starts. We know how the season starts. It starts with the giving of the Spirit, and it ends with the new heavens and the new earth, new creation filling the old. How we get there is up to us. We're in the in-between. The Spirit's given. We know how it ends. How are you going to get there? you got a role to play. And it's important that we know how the whole story goes, seasons one through five, because if you know the story you're in, then you know how to act. If you got cast in Star Trek, you better not show up in a cowboy outfit. You need to know the story you're in so that you know how to live. You understand? So now that we're in season five, the Spirit is given. There's three primary things that the Spirit does throughout the Bible. Three primary roles that the Spirit of God is responsible for. The first one is creation slash recreation. Whether we see the Spirit in the beginning, in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. In the New Testament, the Spirit is credited for uh, for conceiving Jesus in the womb. So whether he's hovering over the chaotic waters of creation, or he's hovering over a barren womb, he's responsible for creation. He's responsible for recreation. The Spirit is credited as the one who recomposes Jesus' body, who brings Jesus' body back from the dead. Y'all know Jesus was dead. He was deader than dead. He was as dead as you can get. The Spirit is what recomposed the decomposing Jesus. And in the same way He did that, it's the Spirit that recreates us. You're a new human now. You're a new creation now. You were an old human. You were a homo sapien. Now you're a homo pneumaticus. Can I teach you some Greek? That means you're a person of the spirit now. You're a different type of human. So the spirit, he creates and he recreates. The second thing he does is he empowers and appoints for a task. You all have a task ahead of you. You have a responsibility. You have a purpose. The Spirit is what empowers and appoints you for that purpose. Whether it's the kings of Israel being anointed with the oil for their task to rule and reign over Israel. Whether it's Jesus himself being baptized and coming out of the water and the Spirit resting on him. You all know Jesus didn't do any miracles. He didn't do any ministry until he was empowered by the Spirit. If it was important for him, it's going to be important for you. And that same Spirit, the Bible says, we're baptized in the Spirit, we're filled with the Spirit, we're immersed with the Spirit, the Spirit comes upon us. I like to say this, if you want to see the empowerment of the Spirit and how it works, look for liquid. That's what the Bible's going to use to tell you this is happening. Liquid metaphor. Yes, we are just immersed in all kinds of Spirit. You don't want to be filled with that, though, I'll tell you. <laughs> that's why people will pray for you, and that's why it's okay to pray. Fill me. Fill me. You're just picking up on the liquid metaphor in the Bible. But what you're asking for, empower me for the task you've given me. By the Spirit, appoint me for the task you've given me. So the Spirit, it creates, it recreates, it brings empowerment. And the last thing 
that the Spirit is responsible for is it brings freedom. When Israel is leaving Egypt, they get to the Red Sea. It says a strong east ruach began to blow. And the water divided. And Paul writes in Corinthians, hey, I know that story where the Spirit is. There's freedom. See, Paul comes along, and he, probably more than anybody else, recognizes how this whole story's fit together. And he'll look at you, and he'll say, now that the Spirit's come, you've been made new. Now that the Spirit's come, you've been empowered to actually do what you were meant to do. You all remember, humans were supposed to rule and reign according to God's love and wisdom. Well, now that the Spirit's come, you can actually do that. And now that the Spirit's come, you're free to do what you were meant to do. You once were bound by the powers of sin and death and darkness, but now you're free. See, Paul knows all that. And so Paul isn't going to mess around with you. I like to say, Paul don't play. Paul don't play. Some people are like, I don't like Paul. He's not as nice as Jesus is. That's because Paul isn't playing. He's saying, you are a new person. You are empowered to bring new creation wherever you go. You step into the old creation, new creation sprouting up. You go into the kingdom of darkness, it's being replaced by the kingdom of God. And you're free to do it. That's what you are. Can I not ask you to be what you are? Is that too much to ask? Will you just be what you really are? Paul's not going to mess around with you. And I figured since you're here on the 4th of July, you're real, real faithful. I'm not going to play either. Is that all right? Is anybody out there done playing? I'm done playing church. I'm done just flowing through my life. I want to make a difference. I have a great purpose and a great task at hand. I'm bringing the king of God, kingdom of God wherever I go. I'm empowered to actually do it. And I'm free to actually do it. Do it. Paul's not going to play. And so... What's interesting, you know it's the 4th of July, so we're going to talk about freedom. And Paul writes to the church in Corinth, now where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. About five or six years later, Paul's writing another letter to a church in Philippi, but this time, he's in chains. He's in prison. Five years ago, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Now I'm in jail. And we might think, well, maybe Paul's going to go back on what he said. Maybe Paul's having some second thoughts. But if you've been paying attention so far, you'll remember, Paul don't play. I should have called this message, Paul don't play. Somebody write that down. Save it for me for later. <clears throat> In Philippians 1, verse 12, let's see what Paul says. He says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else, I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have come, become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. See, Paul makes a decision. I didn't choose to be in jail. I didn't choose these chains. But I'm going to choose how I respond to it because I'm still free. I'm free up here. I'm free in here. And so Paul decides, I'm going to choose a different chain. I'm chained for Christ. I didn't choose my situation, but I'm going to pick who I'm chained to. 
Anybody in here have some situations you're going back home to that you didn't choose? One? One of you? I didn't choose my situation, but I'm still making a choice. I'm free. I'm free. I'm making a choice that, God, if these chains aren't going away, I'm going to ask you, use the chains. I'm chained for Christ. And what I've seen happen is that my chains are setting everybody else free. And then he says in verse 15, it's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? Could somebody say, what does it matter? What does it matter? The most important thing is, in every way, whether false motives or true, Christ is preached. What does it matter? The most important thing. The most important thing. <clears throat> what are your priorities today? It's a pretty American church thing. It's an American church concept to want all of the benefits of God without God. You want God's peace without God's priorities. <clears throat> you can pray eight hours a day for God's peace in your life. You can cry out and cry out. But if your peace is tied to how your husband treats you, because that's the most important thing to you, some of you have chained your peace to crazy cubicle girl at work. Why are you chaining your peace to crazy cubicle girl? You knew she was crazy. You could see it in her eye. You guys know what I'm talking about when you see it in the eye. Why are you tying your peace and your joy to crazy cubicle girl? You get to decide what the most important thing is. What the most important thing is. You choose. What comes next? The most important thing is dot, dot, dot. If the most important thing to you is that people like you, when people don't like you, you won't like you. But if the most important thing is that God loves you, when people don't like you, you still like you because you know that you're found in the love of God. If the most important thing in your life to you is your comfort, then when it is 68 degrees Fahrenheit and you're surrounded by all the people that you like, you will be happy. But if the most important thing in your life is your calling, you can be completely miserable but turn your mis misery into a ministry. Because you're tied to something deeper than just your comfort. Come on, I'm looking for some people that are here today who say, I'm not going to be concerned anymore with popular opinion. I'm not going to be concerned anymore with my preference. I've come to a place in my life where the most important thing is that I know him and that I make him known. Are you out there? See, for Paul, he decided his most important thing and what he was going to chain his life to wasn't his popularity. It wasn't his preference. It was his purpose. Most important thing is that Christ is proclaimed. You know, one uh, commentary I was reading on this, the guy who wrote it, he said, you know, Paul must have been going kind of senile at this point in his life. He must have got hit in the head a few too many times by some big rocks because he's in chains talking about choices. I don't know if I want to live or die. I don't know if it's better to stay here or to go be with the Lord. Well, they didn't ask you, Paul. Why do you think you have any choice? 
I told Jenny Tran this morning, I said, that's what you tell them when they come to you and they say, I don't think I like that song that you sang this morning. You tell them, we didn't ask you. <clears throat> you can imagine Jenny's going to say that to you. <clears throat> can I teach you probably the most significant life lesson I've learned up till this point in my life? Most of you know I've traveled halfway around the world, studied the deep things of Vegemite and kangaroos to bring this point back to you. If at this point you think I'm not talking to you, I am talking to you. If at this point you think I've been in church long enough, I'm spiritual enough, I know enough, I'm talking to you. I wish we could afford a VR, virtual reality headset for every person so that you could all just see my head floating right in front of you so that you'd know he's not talking to my husband, he's not talking to the person next to me, he's talking to me. Are you ready? If you got your notes, write this down. If you got a good memory, remember this. Most important life lesson I have for you. You are only responsible for the choices you make. You are only responsible for the choices you make. Paul writes in Romans chapter 14, one day everybody's going to give an account to God for themselves. Now, I find that A lot of people must think that verse says you're going to give an account to God for everybody else. Come on. Don't tell me you've never heard an account of somebody told to you. Don't pretend you haven't told an account of somebody. I've been a pastor for a little while now, leader in church. I hear a lot of accounts of other people. I hear a lot of accounts of other people. And I I always think the best of people. So I know people aren't coming to me thinking I'm going to be on their side. Right? Surely that's not what you're doing. You're not going to expect I'm going to be on your side when this other person's not even there. And I know surely people aren't giving me an account of somebody because... They just want to blame somebody else for the problems in their own life. Y'all wouldn't do that, right? I'm thinking the best of people. So what I assume is that people are just trying to practice for when they have to give an account to God. And I'm glad that people are practicing. I think that's good. But I want to help you a little bit today by telling you you're practicing the wrong thing. Because you're not going to give an account to him of somebody else. You're going to give an account to him of yourself. And a lot of people's conversations with God are going to go something like this. God, they hurt me, so I hurt them. And you know what he's going to say? You did what? God, they irritated me, so I cut them off of my life. You know what he's going to say? You did what? I hope you're not thinking I'm being too harsh with you today. One day you're going to thank me because it's better to hear it from me today than from him then. Hello. Imagine if you could stand before God and say, God, I had a choice. I had a choice. I know I'm responsible for my choice. I had a choice that would bring healing and bring restoration Or I had a choice that would bring hurt. A choice that would damage. And God, it was really hard. And it didn't feel good. And it didn't feel right. And everybody was telling me that I shouldn't do it. And I prayed about it. And it still didn't feel right. I prayed about it again. And it still didn't feel right. But God, I knew I wasn't responsible for the outcome. I wasn't responsible for the 
what people thought of me. I wasn't responsible for the ripple effect of my decision. I wasn't responsible for how the other person responded. I knew I was responsible for the choice I made, and so I chose healing anyway. But I had to check in my spirit. <clears throat> yeah, I made a choice. It hurt somebody. I made a choice. Probably derailed their life. I made a choice. They haven't been back in church since, but I had to check in my spirit. So I had to do what I had to do. Y'all know what a check in your spirit is? That's, that's Christianese for I don't like them. Some of you are thinking, that's not what checking my spirit means. A check in my spirit means I walk in discernment. I'm being led by God. You really want to talk to me about how to speak Christianese? Have you met my mom? I popped out in Sunday school. Your kids... Our coloring pictures of Peppa Pig and Paw Patrol. I was coloring Jesus, den Peter denying Jesus. Coloring pictures of Peter denying Jesus, that'll jack you up. I wasn't allowed to say the name Harry Potter until I was 25 years old. And you want to come talk to me about how to speak Christianese? I've got a check in my spirit. I don't like them. They rub me the wrong way. But it sounds better if I say God told me not to like them. I got red flags. I got all kinds of red flags about them. I'm putting red flags all over them. How about this? How about you stop sticking your red flags in people and you start sticking your red flags in your choices? Because that's what you're responsible for you got to check in your spirit. You need to check in your choice. <clears throat> you guys are being real quiet. I'm not even done yet. Dr. Bill gave me some prednisone this week. I'm wound, I'm wound tight. <clears throat> That's right. It's been a while. I missed you guys. You know, God's not the only one who comes at us with choices. Uh, Kim, Kim May sent me this article this week. It had this quote in it. I thought it was really good. It says, each choice we make wears grooves in our character that make it easier or harder to make the right decision next time. Beyond decisions, these grooves make up our character qualities. Our youth kids, our young people, they just got back from summer camp. And summer camp's awesome. Summer camp is the time where so many teenagers and young kids, they make a choice for God. The most important choice they'll make in their life. But you know, as soon as they make that choice for God, the devil starts coming at them with little choices. See, because the devil believes in your potential a lot more than you do. And so he starts really young. He just comes at you, not with a big thing, just a little choice. You're hanging around your friends, they're smoking, they're drinking, they're vaping. It's not a big deal. It's just a little choice. And so, you do it again. It's just a choice. It's not a big deal. I got this. I lied to my mom one time but I got this. It's not a big deal. Y'all think this is a youth sermon? They're not in here. If somebody would have told a lot of us this early on, you could have seen a choice 
for what it was. Because your choice, it doesn't stay a choice. I did it again. This time, it didn't hit as hard. So I got to do it again and do it again. And pretty soon, I realize I'm not having a choice anymore. I got to chain. I got to chain. And so I kept doing it, and I kept doing it. And now you know, you're not just having a little glass of wine at night to relax. Now you realize, I can't even choose anymore. I don't even want to do this, but I don't have a choice. I got to chain. And by the way, I know some of you think you're getting out of here unscathed today. I'm not just talking about alcohol and sex and drugs. Some of us gossip so bad, I wish you were an alcoholic. Because there are people who've done more damage with their mouth than anybody could ever hope to do with a bottle. So I'm not just speaking about that one particular thing that you don't happen to struggle with. I'm trying to get you to see your choices become a chain. And I hope, parents and grandparents, that you'll talk to your kids after church today about this. And I hope that you'll find people you can trust in your small group or your friend group. And you'll say, you know, there's been some choices. And they're becoming chains. Today's choices don't seem like a big deal. It's just this little thing. But today's choices become tomorrow's chain. Are you still out there? Some of us spend the majority of our life, decades and decades, being dragged around by the devil and being dragged around by decisions we made early on. We got ourselves in chains. But I know you didn't come to church today on Independence Day to just hear about your chain. You hopefully came to hear the message that there's one who can break every chain. To hear the message about the chain breaker. And so what I want you to hear is that all the decisions of your past are covered by the blood of Jesus. And I read in my Bible that who the sun sets free is free indeed. And I read in my Bible that where the Spirit of the Lord is, do you know it? I don't know if you believe it. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And that, what that means for you is you don't have to spend the rest of your life being chained to the decisions you made in your past. There's a name that will break every chain. It's the name of Jesus. Amen. Worship team, you can make your way back up here. I wonder today... I used all my links. I'm out of links. I went too, I went too hard today. <clears throat> First service, I had some links left. You guys have got bigger chains on you, apparently. But I wonder today, if you make the decision Paul made, it was a pretty easy choice. It's the choice of, I'm just going to pick another chain. My choices become chains. What's the solution? Pick another chain. What if I decided I'm going to trust God? And next time, I don't know about it. It doesn't feel real comfortable. I'm going to trust him again. 
See, all of a sudden, you got a new chain. And what Paul discovered was that there was a chain that's bigger than his sin, it's bigger than your guilt, it's bigger than your shame, and it's a chain called grace. Anybody going to chain yourself to grace this morning? See, when you're chained to grace, you can try to run, you can try to wander, you can try to get away, but you're not going anywhere because you're chained to God. You're chained to grace. I'm wondering if anybody in here is ready to say, I'm getting rid of these old chains and I'm picking up a new chain. I'm picking the chain of grace. You guys can start to play. This is a good time to back me up a little bit. I'm picking the chain of grace. Amen. Would you stand with me? There's not a whole lot left for me to say except to say we're going to give him some praise because he's the chain breaker. Some of you have been letting your chains, those things that you got trapped in early in life, you've been letting your chains break your praise. Today's the day to start letting your praise break some chains. And pick, and it, today's the day to pick up a new chain, the chain of grace, the chain for Christ. You're going to serve something. You're going to be chained to something. Every choice you make is going to make a chain. You get to choose. You get to decide. You're responsible for what you choose. What chain are you going to choose? What are you going to tie yourself to?